I'm a professor of finance, and trust me, I'll talk about finance today, uh, maybe more than most of you are hoping for. But when I was young, professor of finance was not on my most wanted list. Now I was much more fascinated by sports, uh, any sport really. But let me show you one sport that I found really cool, but I was really bad at. Sumo wrestling. Well, for obvious reasons, I was never going to be very successful. But sumo wrestling is a fascinating sport. It has a tradition of over a thousand years. And there's a lot of ritual and honor in the sport. So if you would ever watch a game, you would see that before the match, sumo wrestlers throw salt to purify the ring, to get rid of evil on the ground. And the daily lives of sumo wrestlers still follow strict tradition. So this is really a sport with a lot of honor and ritual. Well, my topic today is academic crime scene investigation. And even in the honorable sports, such as sumo wrestling, there were rumors of match fixing, of wrestlers purposely losing matches. Well, this is not easy to prove, and it turned out that it was academic professors who made the attempt. Mark Duggan and Stephen Levitt, they looked at potential fraud in sumo wrestling, and they did this by looking at large data sets. So before I'll move to my own field, the field of finance, let me talk you through what they did in the world of sumo wrestling. They had a huge set of data, over 10 years of data, over 13,000 fights, and they could see the match outcomes. And this is what they used. So they didn't question wrestlers, they didn't go to matches, but they looked at data. In sumo wrestling, uh, in a tournament, every wrestler fights 15 times. And the eighth win is the most important. So sure, the more you win, the better, but the eighth win is four times more important for, your, uh, for their salary, for their status. So if there's any fraud, you would think, well, somebody who comes up for the eighth win, maybe bribe somebody who already has more than eight wins uh, to beat him. Uh, and that is what they found. Somebody coming up for the eighth win was much more likely to win than you would otherwise expect. And this was especially the case when the wrestlers knew each other well, when they fought each other more often in the past, so collusion might have been easier. And what's really cool is the next time these wrestlers meet, uh, it was the other guy who was more, more likely to win, some, repay, uh, some payment in kind. And all these patterns disappeared when there were rumors in the popular media. So they showed there was fraud in sumo wrestling. Well, I can tell you're not so surprised because, yes, we know there's fraud in sports. I know this. There are plenty of examples. But I think the cool thing here is that you can show there is fraud just by looking at large data sets without seeing potential bribes that are being paid. Authorities could then follow up. So in the sumo wrestling example, uh, the police investigators started investigating uh, cell phone text messages, and indeed they found suspicious me messages uh, indicating that messages were uh, being sold. And later, several wrestlers admitted to, uh, to fraud. So now it comes, we should do the same in the world of finance. In finance, we are drowning in data. We have such a lot of data, right? We know the profits of companies, we know how they're financed, uh, you can track stock prices at any point in time, uh, you can find press releases. The information out there is huge, and it's getting better and better with increasing level of details. So in finance, we're drowning in, in data, but we're starving for wisdom. The financial world has a really poor reputation. How do I know this? Uh, well, we ask people. You can do a survey uh, asking people how to rank all the different industries in the economy based from best reputation to worst reputation. Well, recently, finance is typically at the bottom. Well, sometimes it's tobacco, the tobacco industry, but then finance is really close to being at the bottom. Uh, social media tells the same story. If you look at uh, tweets, it turns out that almost 90% of those tweets about banks are negative. So the financial world has a problem with trust. And this is troublesome. In a way, what we're selling in finance is, is trust. Right? You invest in a stock for the promise of getting a future return. So if people don't trust financial markets, uh, they stop investing in financial markets, which means it's much harder for companies to get financing, right? which means there's uh, less investment, there's less innovation, there's less employment, lower economic growth. So this stuff is important uh, to us all. So I'm a professor of finance. Uh, I study numbers, a lot of numbers, big financial data. 
And I can tell you're, you're starting to feel sorry for me about how boring my life is. <laughs> but I'm here to tell you that it's actually crucial. It's vital that somebody looks at these big financial data. Uh, one big problem in the financial world is insider trading. Insider trading re really reduces trust in financial markets. And this is something I've looked at. So in insider trading, it's somebody with private information trading on this to make a profit. Right? It's the privileged few making a profit at the expense of the outsiders, of ordinary investors. Right? And this has sparked a popular outrage about the excesses of Wall Street. It's one of the most common white-collar crime these days. So insider trading is problematic. What if finance professors could reduce insider trading? Well, I think we can. Right? Just as you can study fraud in sumo wrestling by looking at a large set of data, you can do the same uh, with insider trading, looking at a lot of uh, information. Right? People might lie, but these data, they tell the truth. So let me show you uh, a graph from a study that I've done with two uh, co-authors, and we will look at insider trading. So I'll show you the, the trading pattern uh, later in a second, but what the graph currently shows on the horizontal axis is the number of days uh, compared to the announcement day. So day zero is an announcement day. When news comes out, 10 means 10 days after the announcement, minus 10 means 10 days before the announcement. So insider trading, assume you're the boss of a big company, and there's been a disaster in one of your factories. Right? What, you, what you should uh, do then is announce there's been a disaster, and then you can trade in your own stock. That's fine. What is not allowed is to first sell all your stock and then disclose there's been a disaster in one of your factories. Right, what we look at uh, is short interest around the announcement of a private placement uh, with convertible issues in the United States. So it's, it's not about disasters, but the idea is the same. It's allowed to trade afterwards, it's not allowed to trade before day zero. So what do we see? When does short interest go up? Uh, well, there's a pretty big increase about four days before the announcement. So clearly, before it's legal to trade, we do see there's a lot of trading. There's much more information in the study that I have time for uh, to tell you, so you sort of have to trust me here. Uh, then we show that this is insider trading. Right? For example, we show that this pattern is much stronger when we know that more people have inside information. And we also know that these people that trade before the announcement are not simply guessing, no, they're making huge profits. They know the type of information that comes out uh, later. So this is forensic finance. And I think these studies matter. Uh, for regulators, for example. <laughs> finance academics, we're good at looking at large data sets. That's what we're trained to do. And this is harder for regulators, who often claim to be understaffed, underfunded. <laughs> finance academics uh, can do a careful, structured analysis of big financial data, controlling for a lot of other factors, and ruling out all kinds of alternative explanations right, before we draw conclusions. And here we can show regulators and prosecutors where to look, in which markets around which transactions is there suspicious behavior. Right, in our case, this is when there's a lot of uh, insiders involved and really large negative announcement effects. To be clear, I don't think we should use general data to accuse particular people of uh, committing fraud. We really have to work together with regulators and prosecutors. We can tell them where to look, on which transactions, which markets, and they can follow up. Just as what happened in the sumo wrestling example. It's about working together. Sunlight is often said to be the best disinfectant. And this is highly relevant here. We need sunlight. We need to shine some light on the financial world. If people know that they're being watched, the problem might already uh, reduce. Right? If people know that forensic finance is a big thing, then people who are thinking of committing financial fraud might refrain from doing so. So we can make markets fairer uh, just by knowing that forensic finance is a big thing. For me, forensic finance really provides an opportunity to do research about things that people care about. So let's have finance academics help out regulators. Let's make markets fair, and let's increase the trust in the financial world. Thank you.